first of all, really nice um, and that we can be part of this. So thanks a lot um, for, for that. Um, yeah, so um, I'm Ista Bosart. And I'm Cecilia Raspanti. And of course, a few years ago, we set up the Textile Lab Amsterdam at Waag, where we do uh, very broad research into more sustainable futures for the textile and fashion uh, industry. And I think our interest really vary from more technical material research to more systemic and cultural research. So we will speak about that a little bit later in the, in the presentation. But um, I, I think together we, we have a really broad range of interest. But for sure, we want to find uh, better alternatives for this very horrible industry, I would say. <laughs> Okay, I will first tell something about more, because uh, of course we, we uh, set up the textile lab a few years ago, but we are part of a, a bigger organization which is called Waag. So I will first start uh, telling a little bit more about Waag, because that really has a big uh, influence on also how we set up the textile lab. Okay. So uh, within the textile lab, <laughs> of course, there are two of the three at this, uh, this moment. Um, and what I said before, we have very different interests, but I think what we share, the three of us, is really our values and uh, our interest in the field of uh, fashion and, and, and textile. So uh, Cecilia is much more also the material and technical uh, expert. I'm more interested also in the more cultural side. And together we really look also again at the systemic, so really the overarching. And Margarita is also very much uh, into uh, really the hands-on material uh, research. This is our uh, office. <laughs> so each morning when we arrive and enter the building, it's, uh, it, it feels really nice to kind of enter this little castle in the middle of uh, Amsterdam. And we, um, Waag is uh, founded in uh, 1994 and always focused on really emerging technologies and making them meaningful. So what we do is really we try to um, understand and really open up technologies in order to also have a say and maybe change them for the, for the better or come up with uh, better alternatives. We have four different research labs, so make, code, care and learn, and each lab uh, again, they all share really the same values, but uh, their field of research differs. So, where MAKE uh, really focuses on, let's say, questions about uh, society, uh, ecology, and just research through making, through material, um, the other labs, let's say, focus much more on um, awareness when it comes to these new technologies, and also informing people and also offering new uh, alternatives to that. Creative uh, or the care lab um, really co-creates with designers, with final users to come up with better solutions for, for healthcare. And learn focuses much more on how we learn, what we learn, and to come up with more contemporary ways of learning. Yeah, and it's maybe also good to still mention that um, in the make team, so in the Waag building that you saw on the, on the image, we have three physical labs. So the other ones are much more uh, when it's about, let's say, research or uh, development of programs. And we really have the physical places. So uh, in the, the, the wet lab, uh, it's really a place for uh, bio artists uh, and bio designers. Uh, we have the fab lab, which is really all about uh, digital fabrication. And of course, the textile lab. So. This is the, what we really have in common, all, let's say, all the people working at Waag. So um, often we think when we buy, let's say, a phone or a computer or use other more, let's say, technical tools, um, that, it's, that it's neutral. But we say that everything that's made is not neutral. So also code is never new, uh, neutral. So that's why it says code is culture. Uh, so we really try to be aware of that and see how we want to do that differently. Um, and our main, I think, uh, adagium is really if you can't open it, you don't own it. Because if you don't understand how something works, it's very hard to be involved in the discussion um, and, and, be, and, and actually say how you want it to be. So that's why we want to open anything, everything, no matter if it's a phone, a computer, a, a, a material. We just really want to understand and also make things accessible. So that's why we are so happy with the three labs. So we can actually really invite people to understand how things work. Yeah, so this is just, uh, just two examples um, how complex nowadays products and systems actually are. Because of course, if you see this car, uh, I always say I will not be able to reassemble and make it back into a car, <laughs> not at all. Uh, but if you have a technician or someone uh, that uh, is really into, <laughs> into these uh, things yeah, that's in cars, 
um, then that person is able to do it. But nowadays, cars are often so complex and um, maybe you need uh, an, an engineer, you need uh, the, the mechanic, you need the, the technician, the electronics. So you need a whole team to maybe fix your own car, which makes that you, you cannot do it yourself anymore. So this is another project by Thomas Twaits, and he um, looked for the cheapest toaster he could find. So maybe not even 30 pounds. Uh, and he completely disassembled the toaster to see what it was actually made of. And he thought, okay, seems simple. I want to do it myself and see if I'm able to, to make this toaster. So in the end, he had to travel the whole world. <laughs> he had to collect materials from all kinds of places. He spent so much time uh, understanding how things are made, the whole process. It took him months and months. Um, and of course, it was really not very sustainable if you need to travel everywhere and need to source all these materials that are needed. This is his first prototype. <laughs> I think we agree that it's not very, I don't know, useful, let's say. Um, in the end, he put it in the shop. And what was actually the most difficult was also molding the, the plastic to make a good plastic and this is the final price he had to sell it for which yeah it's not even close to 30 pounds of course and i'm sure he did not calculate his flights all the the hours so i'm not even sure it's a realistic uh, number yeah. but with this project he really wants to show that we're actually so much more connected than we all think even by the products the materials come from everywhere and also um, uh, that it can just not be that it's only 30 uh, pounds so it's a very critical project to actually show uh, what things are made of and how we are all connected through our products so you're probably wondering now what is textile advancement and how do we work so first of all we would love to show you a little glimpse of what the textile lab look and also a few of our community members that are present in the video that we will be showing. So what you also really see here is a very big variety of people who come and explore completely different uh, topics in completely different ways. And this is very important for us, as also Ista was saying, this multidisciplinary aspect is fundamental for the way we research and the way we explore sustainability together. And of course, we talk about making, we talk about our past heritage and craftsmanship techniques that we, we don't want to forget them, but we want to bring them, we want to bring that knowledge together with new knowledge with the upcoming and emergent technologies with digital fabrication and biotechnology because together as we were saying through collaboration transparent process by working through collective intelligence we can actually really change the world as we see it today and and bring it closer to what we would imagine and really push the boundaries in order to make this change start and continue and we believe that only by building upon each other's knowledge this is actually possible. So open source documentation and research is really at the core of our work. So we also want to walk you through, let's say much more a methodology. We will be presenting all different research lines and different projects, but each one of them has one thing in common, which is the methodology with which we research. Basically, we always start from in-depth research, which is practice-based, it is really looking at how things are made. It is rooted in reality. To then pass on to a phase which is of knowledge exchange with peers, where we teach, we explore, we document together, and ending up into a release phase. The release phase is really focused on creating this change of culture, change of narrative, and of mindset to explore what we call tales for a better future. So all together, we start really from the material to explore tools, processes, systems, and then a change of culture. And what are the, the means to do this? Our technology, biotechnology, digital fabrication, and our traditional uh, heritage techniques. So we will be introducing all different research lines, as I was uh, saying, and the first one will be really about sustainable materials. So really, what is the material ecology? 
what, how do we collect materials and why do we do this? So the project that introduces this is really our material archive. And the main question is really, how can we design for circularity? So one of the first materials, we will be showing a collection of different ones and different explorations, really starting from the materials, walking into the tools, then the processes, the systems, and this promotion for the change of culture. What you see here is actually um, gelatin-based, bio-based, biodegradable, and biocompostable material that is made out of food waste, is made out of gelatin, and it can be um, remolded, remelted and reassembled infinite wet times just by adding a little bit of water and a little bit of heat. This means that we have a material that is extremely circular, starting from waste, becoming a product and then being able to be reintroduced into its own chain to create new materials again. And these are another three uh, beautiful sustainable biomaterials that we created in the lab. The first one on the left side is actually also made out of food waste. It's made out of fish scales and natural pigments. Together it creates a really strong resin-like material that many people would not have expected to come from food waste. The one at the bottom is again a gelatin-based resin that is rock solid and it's dyed with uh, hibiscus flowers. The one on the right side is instead a rubbery-like, almost silicon kind of material. So it's a gelatin-based material that stretches and completely bends itself almost like a sole of a shoe or, or a rubber really. But of course we, we don't only look at materials by themselves because we want to talk about the entire design process. So we also really look um, at tools, but also botanical dyes. So also earlier in the other image, we were looking at the hibiscus dyed uh, piece. For us also the color is extremely important. Very often we look at new ways of creating materials. And when people think about biomaterials, they think about very sad gray beige colors, but actually nature is filled with pigments, is filled with beautiful colors, botanical colors or bacteria colors. So very often when we craft materials, we look both at our heritage techniques, such as botanical dyes, but also at uh, more futuristic techniques and later we will be presenting one of them, which is the BioShades project, which is about textile dyeing with bacteria. So past and future for us always need to come together, also in the design and the material research. But of course, we also look at tools and techniques. So what you see here actually is an exploration on using 3D printing on textiles. And we do this to create self-shaping materials and self-shaping products to actually innovate and create much more sustainable uh, inputs for the logistics. Basically what we do is we 3D print on stretch textiles and then they can be transported flat to create, to then be released the moment they arrive at location and then unfold into fully three-dimensional objects, shapes or textures. And this completely changes the way of course we also ship but also looking again at waste as a resource and innovating processes. So looking at modularity and reassembly for circular economy. What you see here are laser cutted elements, modules that can actually be reassembled infinite times in all different shapes. And they've all been laser cutted in this case, actually out of waste leather. Um, so very often the textile and fashion industry have very small leftovers of leather that are being discarded. Instead of being discarded, these can be redesigned, scanned and laser cut it into these modules to then create beautiful products that actually can, can change also over time because you can reassemble them in whatever shape and whatever color combination you would like. This also changes the way we look at sizing because in the fashion and textile industry, of course, sizes are also very important. So looking at the extra small, a small, a medium and a large, if we use modules, we could actually swap clothing and change them as we go. So create them wider, make them smaller and continuously change the entire system with which we produce clothing. Of course, materials, tools and processes are also really there for us to explore in order to change systems and to promote this change of culture. And when we look at systems, especially in the material world, what we did is brought together an entire material archive that has more than 150 um, different materials that are fully open source documented. So designers in our community, but also researchers, product designers, industrial designers can actually come to the lab at VAR 
and explore these materials, understand how they're made, understand what, are the, what is the recipe, so really what is the process to produce them, but also how do they relate for, to each other and which ones will be the most interesting for their future designs. So we really create an, a fully open source system, which when we look at material archives is quite, um, is quite innovative. They're very often closed source and nobody will share how they have been made or what are the resources behind these materials. And we have tried to turn, flip the coin around and actually do the opposite. What happens when you release 150 recipes of materials into the world and how do designers react to this and how do they embrace then open source also. And of course, all of this together, this system and all of these processes, tools and material research comes together for a change of culture, really in documenting, releasing these open source recipes. And these are some of the examples, but we have also, of course, a lot more. And of course, the booklet that we also made uh, for the Kyoto Design Lab, much more focusing on the mycelium, on the kombucha. So it's really, the variety is huge. What is very important is that everything is documented very clearly and in a way that is understandable by everybody, both high level experts, scientists and designers, but also much more um, in it, in designers that are just starting with biomaterials and want to have the first approach. And so it needs to be easy enough, but complex enough to actually create this mutual literacy and bring everybody together again into a community of experts because they all become experts together. Yeah, so of course, um, Cecilia touched upon uh, the, the, the different things we really focus on when we think of the tools, the processes, the materials, but of course, uh, also the systems, but of course, we really also need overarching stories. I mean, we're human beings, we need stories. And if we create these stories or these narratives, as we sometimes call them, yeah. if we uh, create them together, it really helps us in perceiving the world differently and really start thinking about this industry and how we look at clothes and textiles uh, differently. This is what we did also with uh, Biomitch uh, Digital. So this was really an exploration if we can actually really look at nature and take that as a reference and an inspiration also for the textile and, and fashion field. So we brought together a lot of designers, um, artists, researchers, students to really look at this question and also to see what happens if you bring all these, uh, let's say, uh, materials uh, together, if we then can actually talk about uh, a textile and fashion ecology. So on the one side, we had uh, artists and designers that really work with living matter as you will also do or already uh, do. Um, so different designers and if we put them together, you can really see uh, maybe we're looking for similarities. What can the, the, the story be? And at the other side, we had uh, the designers and artists that really uh, use, let's say, digitalization to, to mimic a specific phenomena that they see in nature. So again, we all the time had this discussion, can we just look at fashion and textile industry uh, differently and much more as an ecology? And this was really an ongoing story that we were building together that can maybe really bind all the research that we do together. And we would like to introduce you to another research line and project, definitely one of my favorites, which is uh, it's BioShades. BioShades focuses on textile dyeing with living bacteria where the main question is really how can we design for a sustainable future for the fashion and textile industry? So how can we change the way we dye and actually work with living organisms in order to produce beautiful patterns and beautiful natural colors? Yes. So these are some images. We always place these because I find them so incredibly beautiful. These are pictures of the bacteria under the microscope. And they really show you this incredible world that often is 
is hidden because it's so tiny, it's microscopic, and not many of us get a chance to see them. So they're not only incredible for dyeing and for the processes that they bring together, but they're also extremely beautiful. And we would like to introduce you three of them. This is um, Serratia marcensis, uh, sorry, this is Yantino bacterium lividum. This is the first bacteria with which we started and definitely my favorite, I will say, <laughs> because it, it was really the one that made us understand how easy this process is and how accessible this technology is, even though it looks very complex. And I mean, my background is not in microbiology. I have a background as a fashion designer and still was really able to understand how they were growing how to use it and what are the processes necessary. The second example is a mix of the first one, so the Antinobacterium lividum and Serratia marcensis, a different bacteria that actually grows on very interesting medium, also very cheap ones and very, very funny ones, such as peanuts. <laughs> and last but not least, we have the, a mix again. It's um, the Bogisella indigofera overdyed with uh, the Serratia marcensis. So again, this pink, very strong uh, bacteria. So why is this so important for us? Of course, as I was saying, my background is in fashion design, but I entered the world of microbiology and started understanding. But sometimes talking also with scientists and chemists and microbiologists, it's not always easy at the beginning. So we always try to document everything in a way that is accessible for all different backgrounds. So it creates all different entry points to create a space for a conversation between different experts with different backgrounds. What you see here are the three bacteria that I was mentioning before. But as you see, they're both documented as pictures and as you will see later also within manual and visual documentation, but also looking a bit at the chemistry so that we start to create this mutual literacy between the different uh, experts and they're able to have a completely different conversation and dialogue that builds upon each other's knowledge and expertise. Yeah, so if we look also, um, at this, I think this project really shows the variety of our research topics, let's say, and uh, as we'd like really the material, the tools, the process, the systems and the culture. And uh, looking at the dyes, it has a lot of um, uh, pros, let's say, we discovered while doing the research. So uh, first of all, uh, you just need a little bit of water and the water that you use will actually not be polluted like how it happens with chemical dyes. You hardly need any energy because normally you need to uh, dye the, 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 the materials or the, the, the textiles or the yarns at the very high degrees and um, with chemical or with the bacterial dyes you can just do it, we discussed already a little bit before, let's say in room temperature a bit higher from 20 degrees up. And of course, it's, it's renewable because the bacteria, if you feed them uh, the, the right nutrition, let's say, but also if you <laughs> treat them with care and love, we always say, I mean, it's living matter. Um, then it's also, it continues growing. So if you keep plating, if you really keep caring, you can use them for such a long time. <laughs> and the good thing is, I said it already, but no chemicals are, are used. So of course you, you produce some, um, uh, let's say, uh, waste. But you can also really look in, in, in materials that you can keep using, so and glass instead of plastic. Um, but in that sense, it's, it's not a harmful process. And I mean, the people working with it need to be careful. <laughs> of course, you're familiar also with the safety levels. Um, but if you do it um, correctly, then, then, it's not, then it's not dangerous and not harmful. And I think earlier we unfortunately had missed this slide, which is also one of our favorites. So what we're looking here at really the tools again, the open source documentation that we were mentioning. So we try to always do everything both visually in a way that also language barriers are completely, completely disappear because we can really look at the process together and learn from each other. And everything is also available for uh, download online. So as you see here on the right side, this is a small booklet that actually guides you in a step-by-step -step on exactly both what do you need, how do you have to do it, what are the things that you have to be careful about, for example, creating a sterile environment with very DIY tools so that everybody can do this also in a very, let's say, not per se in a, bio, in a specific biolab environment, but just in a clean, uh, in a clean space. And I think if I can add to that, um, this is also a way for us to make sure we, we demystify, because what you see happening, of course, a lot in innovation, 
uh, that people sell something as the new best huge solution. But often with new possible solutions, you create a lot of new problems. So also to break, break open that discussion, it's extremely important for us. And also if we don't document and don't work like that, we are also not able to push it further because we need other experts. I mean, if we look at the, 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 so the, the solutions needed, we really need to work with all these different disciplines. Yeah, this was for us a really wonderful moment um, when we started also doing the research with so many more people and uh, in the end 50 labs across the, the world. Because um, then you can really also see the differences between the countries, you can uh, have different expertise uh, that you can uh, include. So at some point we also gave an online uh, workshop in which we had a lot of participants in all these different labs that were all doing the same workshop that we were giving at that moment in Amsterdam. Uh, so all these people, it really was a community in the end doing that research together. So some uh, labs really were more in touch, let's say with SMEs, other more with scientists and engineers, others more with designers. So also to see what you have in common, but also how you differ and actually can learn from each other. So that was actually suddenly the research, it, it all started off with, can we find an alternative for the chemical dyes and processes? And suddenly this became a tool for really a different way of doing research and a different culture. So, um, of course, all of this research, all of this knowledge that we accumulate and that we, that we share and exchange constantly with others, it is also very important to shape it in a different way to create and help others to achieve this level of expertise. So we really look also through projects such as Fabricademy that we do in collaboration, we co-funded in collaboration with Fab Textiles in Barcelona. We look at how can we train future professionals worldwide and together. So again, this is a project that is based on an entire network of laboratories, especially fab labs very often, but also some bio labs and some hacker spaces and some textile labs, where together by sharing the same tools, we actually train a whole range of students every year um, and also this year, of course, and next year in September, we will start with a new one. So we would love to give you a little bit of a glimpse of both what is Fabricademy, some of the latest students projects of this year that have done exceptional and very critical making research and also a little bit at what are the, the careers and why are we doing this. Uh, because of course, as you can imagine, the real reason is that we not only want to change a textile and fashion industry that is unsustainable and that often doesn't know fully how to innovate yet, but we really want to bring the power of uh, distributed education, collaboration, open source knowledge and large collaborative networks together to make this change happen as soon as possible. So we would love to start also by giving you a little bit of a glimpse of, uh, of what is Fabric Academy and how does it tackle materials, tools, processes, systems, and really the change of culture. Fabric Academy is a transdisciplinary course at the intersection of textiles, digital fabrication, fashion, and biology. Participants research alternative approaches, all striving towards a more sustainable, circular, and transparent industry, guided by a group of international pioneers. So my motivation on starting. And here's some examples. This is definitely one of my favorite of this year. Uh, Luz Bochers, um, who also previously did the Fab Academy, so how to make almost anything, this year took Fabricademy to try also and understand what is the education and values behind this? How can she further explore uh, her own expertise as a teacher and as a researcher? And she, she made the next step on our material archives. So what she, she started from all of the research that we've also shown you earlier, and actually tried to understand what are the new naturals for the Netherlands at this moment. So what are materials that are abundant, that don't need to be imported, but are actually really growing locally or become local, um, local waste, and that can be reutilized to create new systems. And again, question those. So, what are the starting materials for every country and how would this be deployed? And she created uh, for um, a next iteration on the textile material archive uh, system. And another beautiful project that we would like to show you is um, from Beatrice Sandini, the ephemeral fashion lab. She was also a student here in Amsterdam and actually 
The interesting story here is that Beatrice had her own brand of accessories and bags before starting the academy. But while she was scaling up the production of this, she understood that actually she was trying, she was trying to stay sustainable, but actually entered the trap of scaling up and actually felt that she was exactly like all the other unsustainable businesses that she didn't want to be like. She moved to the Netherlands and discovered Fabric Academy. And actually what she created now is the ephemeral fashion lab, which is a mix between um, a laboratory, a research lab and a brand. And she creates products that, are, that have a very interesting lifespan. So they're all based on biomaterials. She creates beautiful bags, wallets and other accessories that are made out of um, either algae extracts or gelatin extracts, but also playing around with all different pigments that grow here naturally uh, and exploring the boundaries of these materials to understand what it will be to have as a product that's um, having selling and having products that are both open source, but also biodegradable or biocompostable. So products with a very specific lifespan that actually also moves along with the, let's say more fashionable trends and every time you could be bringing back your bag that is slowly start to, to change aspects and then create a new one out of it. And here you see a couple of examples. On the left side, you see more her first experiments and the materials that she was working with in the center. And on the right side, you see two of her final products. So also here, we're really tackling circular economy and sustainability because all of these products are also modular and you can also decide to assemble them yourself. So what you see is also, of course, that both these projects and also all the other projects, because we have been having, of course, about 30 graduates a year, tackle all of the different aspects of the research and the methodology. So they explore the materials, the tools, the processes, the systems to create this change of culture. So in that sense, they're able to create extremely complete um, research projects that also really can go up to market but not only because each of the students actually has a different background, a different aim, and actually they, they shape different professional paths and we discover them also every year with them. So I would love to walk you through some of them. Independent innovator is uh, one of the most important ones, definitely. And the ephemeral fashion lab and the work of Beatrice Sandini is crucial here, but also researchers in academia. So far, we've had two PhD students. One has englobated actually her public academy research within her PhD to really explore the hands-on part and understand what it means to also have a researching community within your project. And this is the work of Carolina Delgado with uh, Nature's Packaging System. But we also had another one who actually started exploring uh, e-textiles and electronics at Fabric Academy and realized that she really wanted to pursue this this new passion so much more in depth and actually started her PhD immediately after. A heritage explores, we have many of this. As we were saying, crafts, heritage and new techniques for us as, are very important as a combination because we don't wanna see technology uh, as a means to replace our, our so strongly and so hardly built heritage and all of this knowledge that we have all over the world. And a beautiful project, uh, example project for this is the Batula project from Rabab Abdullah. Another one, another professional path is definitely the industry innovator. This year we had a beautiful example of this with Lucrecia Strano, who created her own micro factory. Lucrecia is a fashion and textile designer, but she actually realized that what she wanted to do is also enable others. So she started her own micro factory of biomaterials and all of the techniques she actually acquired during the Fabric Academy. We also have students that are much more interested in arts and performance design. That, and this is a great example um, of uh, Gabi Lotaif, where she created a piece that actually enables her to express and perform with it and it breathes and inflates according also to her movements and the performance that she has designed. But also wearable tech pioneers. Um, Alaska Accessorios is a project by Betiana Pavon and actually she brought it also up to Madrid Fashion Week and 
uh, really completely changed the way her brand was working and explored much more technology and electronics in accessories and hat making. Then we have what we call the lab directors or lab founders. This year we had another fantastic example with uh, Le Textile Lab in Lyon. Uh, Pauline Gamor not only opened her own textile lab while um, doing Fabricademy, but she also, as a final project, built her own machines because she understood that the most important thing is when you open a lab is that you can open all of your machines, fix them, understand them, and hack them. Because she created a machine now that is meant for a batik dyeing, but actually she was already exploring, hey, I can do so much more with this machine. I just need to change a few components. So creating your own inventory is also fundamental within Fabricademy. And last but not least, some of our favorites, the advocates for change, as we called them. The slide isn't moving but I will show it to you. And here we had a few projects, such as the one from um, Katerina Ale, but also Bella Rofe in Amsterdam. Both of them actually explore activism and ecofeminism and this connection, artistic connection between art and science, humans and nature, to try to bring back this consciousness to all of us to really start to work in a more sustainable way, not only for the planet, but also for ourselves to really be able to keep the future as we have it today alive for future generations and connect us back to our heritage and where do we come from. And what you see here is actually that every year we have more than 20 laboratories around the world. And this is so important for our work in Fabricademy because also when we look locally, every, every student gets the same assignment from their global lecture but how they're executed and what are the local materials is so important because it completely changes the way they also execute these assignments and how they build up their own research. So having this globally shared knowledge and, and also questioning things together and globally, but also learning from each other and seeing how all over the world, the same, um, the same knowledge, the same characteristic can be um, implemented completely different ways is a very important part for Fabricademy. And this is why we so much love our entire uh, <laughs> network of laboratories. And uh, yeah, well, as you can see, every year they change. There are some more, there are some different ones, but they, they're all over the world. And this is very, very important for this change of culture that we're so much striving for. Yeah, and also to, to add to that, because of course we, we often get the question also when it's a, with the, um, dying with bacteria, like, yeah, but is it scalable? Can we make really huge quantities? Can we uh, like conquer the world with it, let's say? Uh, but of course, this is much more spreading model. So that is also what we are looking into. So we don't need to scale and, and be massive. We need to work much more locally, but of course be globally connected. And I, I think to, to, complete, uh, to conclude, this is really how we, we uh, look at our work. So we never say we have the answer. We constantly question. We work with so many people. So we're also constantly learning. And it's, of course, very important. Also, if you look at, it, it, at this industry, it's very much ego driven. It's, it's quite closed. But if you say, like, I also don't know, but let's try, let's make, let's break it open. Then we can work towards the alternatives. Yeah, and it's very much about the, it's also, it feeds you the system of learning and teaching because the more you give, the more you need to, the more you're empty and the more you need to replenish your own knowledge to have something new to give. So this constant cycle is really for us what drives both the research, the education and a chance for a better future. And I think also, um, yeah, just often you see in research that, that, that the, the people the, doing the research place themselves outside, let's say, the research topic. But, I mean, we're covered with textiles. They're everywhere. Everybody has to do with it in some way. So it's very important to really also take from our daily experiences, daily life experiences, and realize that we are part of this uh, ecosystem that we're building, but also researching.